According to the Bible, after God created a universe and a planet perfectly designed to sustain life, he crowned his work with human beings, man and woman, endowed with spirit and soul, free will, and the capacity to make their own moral choices. God created a world in which there were morally free creatures. Human beings can be bad and they can be good. There's a possibility for great evil, but there's a potential for great good when you have moral freedom. And so our greatest blessing, which is the free will we have, the, uh, the, the ability to make choices, moral choices, also is our greatest curse because I often choose the wrong thing. And so does everybody else. And people get hurt out of that, both intentionally and unintentionally. If God creates human beings with the power of free choice, he may foreknow what they're going to do, but he can't determine what they're going to do. Otherwise, they're not really free. And evil entered the world when people freely chose to withhold doing the right thing and instead did the wrong thing. It appears an airplane crashed into the World Trade Center. The World Trade Center, tower number one, is on fire. The whole outside of the building was just a huge explosion. The World Trade Center collapsed. Building two has collapsed. The sheer magnitude of evil and suffering in the world can be overwhelming. And while searching for answers, some have argued that because God created humans with free will, then he's ultimately responsible for evil. It's even been suggested that God created evil. But from a biblical perspective, is that even possible? No, because evil is not a thing. Everything God creates is good. God created the world good just as it was supposed to be. But human freedom then was used in such a way as to diminish goodness in the world and that diminution, that lack, that missing goodness, that is what we call evil. So evil is a lack of goodness. It is goodness spoiled. You could have good without evil, but you can't have evil without good. And so evil was not a direct creation of God. It was the result of humans exercising their freedom. So if it was the free will of human beings that actually caused evil, then I think it's reasonable to ask, why didn't God just create a world where moral freedom didn't exist in the first place? That way, evil and suffering wouldn't exist either. God could have made a world without evil by just taking away our free will to do it. It would have been very easy for him to just simply say, well, I'm gonna make you all marionettes and we'll pull the strings and everybody prays five or six times a day and everybody does right. But God wanted a race of tested individuals who choose to love him. And you cannot love someone unless you have the choice to not love him. The sort of love that humans can give to one another and to God is something which depends on them being able to do it from the bottom of their heart without being forced. As soon as it's forced, it's not love anymore. And so it was a good thing for God to create creatures with freedom because that opened up the possibility that they could actually express genuine love not only to him but to one another in intimate relationship. Sixteen hundred years ago, St. Augustine wrote, Since God is the highest good, he would not allow any evil to exist in his works unless his omnipotence and goodness were such as to bring good even out of evil. Theologians and scholars have long pondered and debated this question. Does a loving God use evil and suffering to accomplish a greater good? I don't know why suffering can't be compatible with God's love. People have this idea that real love rescues from all pain. I ask people when they raise that issue, I say, are you a parent? Do you have children? Do you feel that your love for your children requires you to rescue them from every bit of pain? Have you never let them struggle through a difficult thing on purpose for a good reason? Of course there's an impulse to rescue our kids. We don't want them to suffer egregiously. 
But there are times when we know that it's appropriate to let them suffer in the circumstances for their own good, because a greater good is in view. And we have clues in our own lives. I think almost all of us can look back at some suffering in our past life and say, while I was in this, I didn't understand why God allowed it. And it was a real threat to my faith. And now that I see that it made me stronger, I do understand it. For more than 40 years, the lessons and struggle of growth through suffering have played out daily in the life of Johnny Erickson Tata. In 1967, Johnny, a 17-year-old high school senior, severed her spinal cord in a diving accident, paralyzing her body from the shoulders down. When I was first injured, I uh, imagined myself as a kind of a human guinea pig lying there on my striker frame. I was doing nothing but eating and breathing and sleeping and really just existing. And I thought, in here, you know, most people out beyond these hospital walls are going to college, getting married, having children, going to work. And I'm just lying here, sleeping, breathing, eating. And I realized, oh my goodness, upon my life, <laughs> all the truths of the human race are gonna be tested. Is there a God? Does he care? What's the purpose in life? And if there is no God, then why not have my girlfriend slip my wrist? Why not take my mother's sleeping pills? Why not end it all? I mean, who can face a life of total paralysis? And somewhere in there, in my anger and frustration, I realized life's got to be more than just getting born and growing old and then dying. There's got to be a God who cares. We're too significant. There must be meaning in all of this. I don't think I would have asked those largely life questions were it not for my suffering. In the decades following her accident, Johnny's life has been marked by extraordinary accomplishment. Through her artwork, music, books, conferences, and radio and television programs, she has inspired millions of people throughout the world. In 1979, she founded Johnny and Friends, an international ministry that has taken the love and hope of Jesus to the disabled and their families. Through it all, she has intimately known both the pain of suffering and the presence of God. There are a lot of people who think I'm a strong person, and I'm not. I am such a weak person. I wake up in the morning and honestly, I think, oh Lord, I don't have the strength for this. I am so tired. I am so tired of this paralysis. But when I start to feel overwhelmed, I'll say, oh God, I have no strength for this day, but you do. I have no resources, but you do. May I please have your resources? May I please have your strength? I can do all things through you if you strengthen me. Please let me borrow your smile for the day. And honestly, before the morning has hardly begun, I've already got a perspective on the day. I've already got peace in my heart and a mission to accomplish. And it's because I've been pushed up against God. And God has shown me some deep things about his purpose and himself that for me um, are so satisfying, so pleasurable. I wouldn't trade the wheelchair for anything. To ask why a good God would allow suffering is to ask why a good doctor would uh, put a needle in the backside of an infant to inoculate him. The infant doesn't understand it. All he knows is that it's horribly painful. He can't understand that, in a way, this inoculation is going to prepare him for something in the future that he's not even aware of. And in the same way, um, God is a God of intention. He's got a purpose and meaning and everything he puts his hand to is brimming with intention and meaning. So we can rest assured that although the purposes for suffering might be hidden from us in this present life, his reasons are always wise, they're always specific, and they're always good.
Perhaps the supreme demonstration of God's use of suffering and evil for good was revealed in the death of Jesus. Crucifixion was invented a few centuries before Jesus. It is widely recognized as one of the most horrendous forms of death that any state could sanction against an individual. It was so horrific that Roman citizens were not permitted to be crucified. So it's no surprise that there is a buildup of the forces of evil, if you like, shrieking at Jesus, attacking him, criticizing him, until finally they nail him to a cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There, two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, save yourself, come down from the cross if you are the son of God. At noon, Darkness fell across the whole land, and Jesus cried out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he suffered, the Bible tells us, great emotional and spiritual agony because he experienced separation with his father, and he experienced the actual sin of the world in his own conscious life and what it was like to feel and experience that evil and hurt. It's the worst thing that ever happened. Three hours of darkness. God himself dies. Inconceivable. Did God allow that? Sure. He allowed the devil to creep into Judas Iscariot and Pontius Pilate and Herod and the cruel Romans and allowed the, the worst event in the history of the world. Why? For the greatest thing that happened to our salvation. That injustice was redeemed by an all-wise, all-knowing, all-loving, all-powerful God. He could take those kinds of things and he can turn them in to the greatest goodness imaginable, the salvation that would be available only through him. And only when we see that in the light of the entire longer story do we say somehow this was how God, as it were, drew those forces of evil onto one place in order to defeat and deal with them there, in order to make a new creation beginning with Jesus' resurrection. And that's why ultimately we have hope. So an unspeakable evil was transformed into an unspeakable good through God's wisdom. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. If it can happen on such a magnificent scale like that, if you can see in that one case how great evil can produce great good. If God lifts the curtain just a little bit so you can see behind the scenes there, it's at least possible to believe that that principle is at work everywhere. This is so spectacularly wonderful that it gives us the hope that evil will never be able to be the last word about us. That there will always be a way of finding something good that while the evil was still evil, it can redeem it and keep it from triumphing over us. The Christian response to the problem of evil and suffering was perhaps best summarized by the Apostle Paul. Two decades after Jesus' death and resurrection, Paul described the persecution Christians endured and the hope that sustained them as they preached the gospel throughout the first century Roman world. We are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed but not despairing, 
persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. Therefore, we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. He refers to these things as momentary light affliction. What, Paul, are you crazy? Momentary light affliction? Well, we understand when we read further because he goes on to explain that these are momentary light afflictions in comparison to something else because these afflictions, and he's very particular about our, his words, are producing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And you see, there's this subtle theme through the New Testament that helps us understand this problem of evil as followers of Christ, that God can cause all these things to work for good in our lives because we love him, we're called according to his purpose. And these have a transforming impact on us so that when we get to heaven, we are actually different people than we would have been if we had not gone through these things. These momentary light afflictions are producing for us the eternal weight of glory. If you only lived this life four score and ten and then you died and that was the end of it, the kind of hostilities and hurts that we have in this life would be writ large. Their significance would be stunning indeed. But from the vantage point of life forever with God in heaven, the harms and hurts that happen to us in this life, though still real and still important, are shown to be so insignificant compared to the glories and the joys we're going to experience in the afterlife that from the vantage point of that perspective, they are well, well worth it. Philosopher and atheist Bertrand Russell once said, no one can sit at the bedside of a dying child and still believe in God. Now, on the surface, that sounds like a pretty strong argument against the existence of a loving God. But as Christian philosopher William Lane Craig has pointed out, what is Russell going to say when he's kneeling at the bed of the dying child? Too bad? I'm sorry? That's the way it goes? You see, as an atheist, Russell has nothing else to offer. Because if there is no God, then we're all trapped in a world filled with senseless and unredeemable suffering with absolutely no hope of deliverance from evil. But for the Christian, God does exist. Evil and suffering can result in a greater good, and there is hope and meaning for the future, because life doesn't end in the grave. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but for everyone to come to repentance. Suffering is in this world because sin is in this world. And if God were to get rid of sin, he'd have to get rid of sinners. I think he's delaying closing the curtain on suffering, sin, Satan, until more people have time to hear about the good news of Jesus. And if my being in this wheelchair a little bit longer provides the time and opportunity for others to come into the kingdom, then my wheelchair's worth it. My affliction is just light and momentary, and I, I don't mind waiting. Now that offer of mercy will not be extended forever. There's gonna be a, come a time when he says enough and then he's going to deal with it, and then true justice will be done perfectly. But this is not what we want, really. We don't want justice. We want mercy. And for now, mercy is what's being extended. And this is why you see the continuation of evil. There is so much we don't know about evil, pain, and suffering 
that many times I think were people groping in the dark trying to make sense out of. But God gives us enough to see, to help us to keep on going, and to redeem the pain and suffering we have so it doesn't defeat us. If all I was looking at for the evidence of God was just the problem of evil, sure, I'd say, gee, that's a no-brainer. There is no God. He would never allow these kinds of things. But when I see all the other evidence in other areas for the existence of God and for a good God and a loving God, a God that cares about his creation, who's involved in his creation, well, then that helps put this particular question a little bit more into perspective. But I'll be the first one to admit, it's emotionally difficult. I think most Christians go through a sense of deep puzzlement, which can come sometimes once in somebody's life, sometimes a thousand times in somebody's life, of I really thought God was going to enable such and such to happen, and it hasn't happened. And so, yes, we can have huge disappointments, but the God to whom we go back and on whose door we beat and we say, what on earth is going on here, is the God who says, remember what I have been through. Remember the story of my son. One of the worst things that was ever done in the world was done to the best man that ever walked on the earth. So again, when we put it into the light of Jesus and what happened to him, do bad things happen to good people? What's it all about? It's very strange, but somehow God holds that within his purpose and will bring good out of it and through it. Sometimes when we suffer, we're just hoping somebody will give us the formula, how to fix it. What's the step one, two, three, four, A, B, C, D? Show me what to do, I'll do it. And, and God blows all that to smithereens. He lobs a hand grenade into the middle of it all and, and explodes it. He won't let us approach suffering with our own agenda. We've got to come to him empty-handed, blessed are the poor in spirit. I don't have the answers, God. And when we come to him like that, completely defenseless, and approaching him without a technical, fix-it, mechanistic approach to life, okay, I've got the formula, I know the answers, then we find God to be the answer. We can face anything if we know God is there in the midst of it all. I examined the biblical view of evil and suffering for many months, and honestly, I think I could spend the rest of my life trying to understand it all. The questions can be brutally difficult, and the answers are not quick, and they're not easy. Is Christian theology a satisfying explanation for the suffering in the world? Yes, I believe it is. Does it always offer immediate and total comfort when we hurt? No, not always. But if we come to God in faith, I believe he gives us legitimate reasons for hope that can carry us through the most difficult circumstances of our lives. How could a loving God allow evil and suffering? And why would he offer only a single pathway to salvation? They are demanding questions of undeniable significance. And for many, the answers are found in the life of a carpenter from Nazareth who calmed the seas and died to redeem the world from its sin.